and welcome to Algebra 2 with Mr. Clausen. Today I want to talk briefly about theorems about roots of polynomial equation. And specifically what I want to do is I want to talk a little bit about what each of these theorems are. I want to start with the rational root theorem and then uh, go over examples with irrational root theorem and imaginary root theorem. And what I want to get to at a really simple level is that when I'm looking at a polynomial function, what are the possible roots that could be present? Okay, because we've been looking at this quite a bit now, looking at graphs, identifying multiplicities of roots and all this type of stuff. And what are some basic rules about these theorems? And one of the things that I want to point out is that if something has a rational root, this is just a root where it's, you know, it crosses the x-axis at negative 5 or positive 2. It's some whole number or simple fraction like 3 and a half or something like that. And what you can do is that in any situation, if there is a rational root, you have, you can always take the constant and divide it by the leading coefficient. And what you can do is that you can look at the factors of these values. So for example, plus or minus two, plus or minus one, plus or minus four, plus or minus eight. In, uh, in this case, you'd have plus or minus one. And any of these combinations could be a rational root for your polynomial function. Now, that doesn't mean they all could. It just means that one of these possibilities or more could be. And based on the fundamental theorem of algebra, we know that there should be three roots. And they could be any combination of rational, irrational, or imaginary. And if we look at the function here, one of the things that we're going to see is that negative 2 is a root. And that was something predicted by the rational root theorem. Okay, so if you take anything from the rational root theorem, it should be just that, you know, we can clearly set a domain of values. Oh yeah, plus or minus 16 is also a possibility. But we have a domain of values that we look towards and one of those possible combinations could be a root. And this will always be true for rational roots. Now you could, as depicted in most textbooks, you know, look at all these and plug them into your equation here and figure out where they equal zero. I'm not going to ask you to do that. Some teachers might, and that's fine. It's not a bad skill to know, but I find it really time consuming and it's hard to make an exam that encompasses all that in a reasonable amount of time. But so if we look at that here, you have that. And then any other root that's present, if it's not a whole number like this, might look something like this. And these are irrational roots. Okay. So if we are looking at this, what this allows us to do is that if you have a rational root and you can identify it from the graph here, which is really what I want you to be able to do is identify um, any rational roots. And if there's nothing super simple to go and factor out and do, what I want you to do is I want you to take that rational root and I want you to plug it into a synthetic division situation here. And I want you to factor it out so that we can figure out exactly what this pair of irrational roots are. So if we go and apply it to the situation, we see that we have x squared minus 8 as the binomial that factors out when we divide it by x plus 2. Keep in mind that negative 2 is the root. So what that means is we have to make a binomial where if we plug that root in, it equals 0 so that we can apply it to the 0 product property. Okay, And with that, we know that negative 2 is a root, but we also can see that x squared minus 8 also equals 0. And if we add 8 to both sides, we can very quickly observe that x squared equals 8. Take the square root of both sides, and then we will see that x is equal to plus or minus 
the square root of 8. Or if we simplify that further, it would be x equals plus or minus 2 square roots of 2. And that's what these values are. Okay, so graphing can't tell you exactly what the irrational roots are. I mean, you can make a good educated guess, but we can see that this is 2 square roots of 2, and you could test it with your calculator as well, and this is negative 2 square roots of 2. And we can go and figure out what these are. Okay, so we, and we can observe this too. We can see that, you know, each of these have a multiplicity of 1 based on their linear behavior, and we can see a lot of that based on the um, down then up behavior and up then down and then down and then up again but one of the things I'm just trying to point out with that rational root theorem is that you can do that same thing here you know we see this quartic polynomial we know that there is a total of four roots and the thing is is that some of these might be rational none of them might be rational okay so when we see the situation we can do the same thing I do notice that it's quadratic patterning so I can go and say uh, u squared plus 2u minus 15. But one thing I can do here is I can go look at those factors again based on the rational root theorem like I was talking about before. If you go negative 15 over 1 and you look at all the factors of these numbers, we know that plus or minus 1, plus or minus 3, plus or minus 5, and plus or minus 15 are all possibilities here. And again, the only thing I think is worth mentioning about the rational root theorem, I mean, you can take all of these and manually plug them in. I think that's an excruciatingly time-consuming process, especially when all you need to do is plot the graph, and then you can see if any of those solutions exist. And if any of these solutions do exist, you know that they are a rational root. And the thing is, is that negative 1.732 is not one of these combinations. So that tells me that these roots are irrational it means there's some square root value and if we have u squared plus 2u minus 15 and we use u substitution here because I noticed the quadratic patterning what I'm just gonna do here real quick is I'm gonna split this apart using the tools I have at my disposal and now I can go u minus 3 and u um, plus 5 these are the two binomials that would crash out and with this now, we can go and we can solve for the irrational roots that are here. But the thing is, is I pointed out that there should be four roots. And I also noticed that this is up and then down and down and then up behavior. What that tells me is that the multiplicities of both of these are odd. So these irrational values only make up two of my roots. And then I have two other roots. that are imaginary. So one of the things that I want you to be able to do as we conclude this chapter is be able to split apart and find some of these other roots if need be. So in a situation like this, if we use u substitution, again, we set u is equal to x squared, and we can plug that back in. We can say x squared minus 3 and x squared plus 5. And one of the things that we're going to find here really quickly is that with this root, we can say x squared minus 3 equals 0. Using the zero product property, we can add 3 to both sides. And we can see that x squared is equal to 3. And if we take the square root of both sides, we will see that x is equal to plus or minus the square root of 3. That's what this is. Negative square root of 3, positive square root of 3. And then we can also look at this binomial, subtract 5 from both sides, say x squared is equal to negative 5, we take the square root of both sides, and then we'll find pretty quickly that the two imaginary roots that we were trying to find is x equals plus or minus i square root of 5. And with the rational root theorem, okay, there was no rational roots here, but Again, the idea here is that we can look from the span of negative 15 to positive 15, and if there's no places where it crosses, then hey, there are no rational roots, and we have to use other methods.
okay? But if you do find a rational root, then we can use things like synthetic division and long division and start breaking down some of these higher powered polynomials, which is really the main goal of this lesson is to start showing you some of those patterns. Now, with that, one of the things I wanna point out to you guys is that if you notice on those two examples that I just showed you, both of them had irrational roots. And one of the things that I wanna point out here is that if we look at this example, this irrational root came in pairs, and this pair irrational roots also came in pairs. So one of the things that we need to keep in mind whenever we're looking at this is that this is a property of irrational numbers. They always exist in pairs. Otherwise, you would get these really crazy polynomial equations with these really weird irrational coefficients. And the thing is, is we don't make polynomial equations with irrational coefficients. We make them with rational coefficients. And we maybe put like a decimal on there, but it's still, you know, it's a rational number. And if we did take the ratio of those two numbers, then they would be satisfied by the rational root theorem. But if we're looking at this specific instance, one of the things that we wanna be able to do is if we need to make a polynomial equation with rational coefficients based on the roots, one of the things that's always gonna be true is that if you have a square root like the square root of three, just like in our previous example, it has to have a conjugate that complements it, which is negative three, because if you take x squared equals three and you take the square root of both sides, you're always gonna get plus or minus square root of three. And it's always gonna be the case. And this special value that we have here that complements it is what we would call a conjugate. Every irrational number, if it's identified as a root, is gonna have a conjugate that goes with it. And the same thing here. Now we have four minus the square root of six. Now what's gonna be the conjugate here is four plus the square root of six. So again, keep in mind that it's only the irrational part that you switch, but you're gonna have these values that complement it, that are conjugates. And then we could take this and then we could go and make a polynomial equation with this. So for example, you know, x plus the square root of three is a root, x minus the square root of three, which is one of the roots, and then you have x minus four minus square roots of six, and then you have x minus four plus square root of six are your values here. And big tip I can give you here, always multiply your conjugates together first and then multiply other things together. Don't try to do like this one with this one and this one with that one and then try to make some, it's just a mess. You're dealing with square roots all over the place and it will just about make you wanna pull your hair out. But if we look at this situation, one of the things that you always get when you multiply a conjugate together is that if you multiply x with x, you get x squared, x with negative square root of three, negative x square root of three, square root of three times x plus x square root of three, and then square root of three times square root of three, which would be negative three. And the thing that you'll always get is when you multiply the conjugates together, the irrational parts always cancel out. Okay, and the same thing will occur here. But one thing I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna distribute those just to make my life a little easier. So we're gonna say, x minus four plus square root of six, and x minus four minus square root of six, just so I don't get anything mixed up. And I'm gonna foil these trinomial expressions. So if we go x and x, we'll go x squared minus four x minus x square root of six, and then we'll go negative four times all of these, so we'll go negative four x again, plus 16, um, let's see, plus four square roots of six. And now if we go square root of six times that, we'll get positive x square root of six. We'll get negative four square roots of six. And then we'll get negative six as a result. So square root of six times negative square root of six will give me that value. And again, what I'll see is that the irrational parts always cancel out, and then what we will get as a final result is that we'll get 
x squared minus 3 times x squared minus 8x. That's what these guys add up to. Plus 16 minus 6, which will be plus 10. And if we want to figure out what the polynomial equation is in standard form is usually how it's expressed. We're going to go x times x squared. We'll go x to the fourth. And we'll go negative 8x cubed. And then we'll go positive 10x squared. And then we'll go negative 3 times x squared. That will give us negative 3x squared. And then that will give us negative 24x and then negative 30. And all this allows us to do is if we combine all of this together and simplify accordingly, we can go and create the polynomial that we were originally asked to create, which would be x to the fourth power minus 8x cubed plus 7x squared after we do the math for that part, minus 24x minus 30. So that is your polynomial equation with rational coefficients based on finding all the roots that have to be present with the rational root theorem. Imaginary roots are almost identical in their behavior to irrational roots. If you have an imaginary root like this one, this is a imaginary root. If you have an imaginary root, it always has a complex conjugate that goes with it. So if 1 minus i is a root, 1 plus i has to also be a root because this is the complex conjugate to it. And with this root, we're not going to do that with it because we can clearly tell that this is a rational root. And rational roots are the only types of roots that don't have to be paired. So what that means is that if, let's say, you have a cubic polynomial, you know you have to have one real root or three real roots. There wouldn't be two real roots and then, like, a irrational or imaginary paired uh, all by itself. Like, they always have to be paired. Okay, so sometimes that can be useful to keep in mind. So in this case, what we will find is that this is going to be a cubic polynomial when it's done because we have the one rational root, and then we have the pair of imaginary roots here. And if we're going to go and we're going to make the polynomial function with rational coefficients, what we're going to do is that x plus 5 would be the binomial made by that rational root. Okay, because if we plug negative 5 in, that's going to equal 0. And then we're going to say x minus 1 minus i. And then x minus 1 plus i. And let's simplify this out a little bit and distribute the minus sign because that always gets me when I'm trying to foil this stuff. Minus signs are so hard to keep track of sometimes. So just make it easy for yourself. And then you have the x plus 5. But I'm going to multiply the conjugates together first because if we do the x plus 5 with one of these and then try to go through, we're going to have i's everywhere and it's just going to be a nightmare. So just multiply the complex conjugates together first. It will make your life easier, I promise. Okay, so go x times x. That'll give us x squared by negative x by negative i x negative 1 times x will give us negative x again, plus 1, and that'll just give us plus i all by itself. And then let's go i times x. That'll give us plus, actually, let's put it down here. Let's go plus i x negative i. negative i squared. Okay, so I factored all this out. And again, just like with the rational roots, you're going to see that the imaginary parts cancel except for the last doohickey here. But you know that i squared is equal to negative 1, and this is negative i squared. So this will be minus negative 1. So what we'll be able to do is we'll see x squared minus 2x plus 2 will be the part that comes out here, x squared minus 2x plus 2. And then we can take the x plus 5 and put it back in here. 
and now we can combine these components. So let's go x times x squared. That'll give us x cubed. Negative 2x squared plus 2x. 5 times x squared will give me plus 5x squared minus 10x plus 10. Okay, combine like parts, x cubed plus 3x squared minus 8x plus 10. And that would be the polynomial equation based on the two imaginary roots plus the root of negative 5. And if you graph this, you would see that it would cross the x-axis at negative 5 and it wouldn't touch it anywhere else. So with that, I'm going to conclude this video. Your homework will be based on these. I hope you have a better understanding of these different root theorems and some of the information that you can glean from this. Uh, in my next video, what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at some advanced applications of where I can combine all these different theorems that we've been talking about this chapter and how we can break down large polynomial functions and find all the individual solutions using all these techniques. So with that said, I hope you have a great rest of your day and let's do math.